We think it's about time to kick off. Take us away, knock our socks off. <laughs> cool. Oh, thank you everyone for joining us for the, the first of the two conference wrap sessions that we're having. Um, so we're gonna go through what people did in the sprints. Uh, so first up is the documentation sprint. Uh, Alex, you and who else would like to talk about this? Yeah, I can talk about this. Um, so what we did was stare at the DataCube core docs and rewrite a bunch of them. Some of it's fixing little typos. Some of it was deleting large, large sections. And I think that made it a bit more easy and corrected some of the things that have changed since it was written. But something that we're going to do as a follow on is what's shown in the picture there, which is align the documentation with a bit more of a, a user centric kind of view. I think that those documents have evolved from as, as something written by the developers of DataCube Core. And now we're sort of getting to the point where we'd like the users of the DataCube in general to be able to you have an accessible kind of documentation, as well as having hardcore API documents and how to install the data cube. It's nice things like how to load data and how to how to do mad science. So I think that's going to continue, which is pretty cool. So we'll keep chatting in the in the sprint channel, I think, for a while and try and keep it moving. So yeah, look, it was it was fun and I think we've improved things and we'll continue to do so. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you, documentation team. Uh, so now we're going to move on to the science sprint. Uh, Chad. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, yeah, so um, my sp sprint ended up just being me, but um, I uh, investigated using uh, satellite time series and other data sets to try and make um, short-term predictions about um, NDVI. So I built uh, two notebooks in the end, one that was built around machine learning and the other that was built around this thing called vector autoregression, which was using um, uh, multiple data sets to make predictions. So uh, on the VAR model on the on the left there, um, so uh, this vector autoregression was something new to me that I was reading about, but basically it means that every variable is a linear function of the past values of itself and the past values of all the other variables. Um, so this model here is ingesting um, a, a monthly time series of uh, root zone soil moisture and surface soil moisture, which comes from the, uh, a data set called GRAPHS, which is the Global Root Zone Moisture Analysis and Forecasting System. And it's taking rainfall from um, er the ERA-5 reanalysis data. Uh, and NDVI is coming from Landsat 7 and 8. Um, so the the predictions you see here, the top one is for the a native grassland in Pilbara and the bottom one is for a cereal crop. Um, these predictions, uh, these forecasts, um, they use an, uh, two months of data. They use the antecedent two months of data to predict the next two months of data. And then I iteratively went back through the forecast doing that at every time, every four time steps in order to end up with um, a forecast that maps along the observations in order to, to test its ability. Um, so the NDVI for the grasslands layer is, you can imagine, is very much driven probably exclusively by rainfall unless it's groundwater dependent. So it seems to be have a better predictive ability there. Whereas in the cereal crop, um, it tends to be less accurate because there's obviously a lot of anthropogenic drivers. Like you notice, um, if you look closely, you can sort of see that the it always uh, it's always late predicting the decline of NDVI because obviously it's harvested. That's why it declines, uh, not just due to rainfall. So, um, so given that these, yeah, these data sets, the graphs data set is 10 kilometers in resolution and the rainfall is 30 kilometers in resolution. And for these examples, I'm just grabbing out a little small window, you know, the size of a paddock or the size of a bit of grassland in the Pilbara. Um, I think that's pretty, pretty decent predictions. And so, sorry, and quickly just on the, on the right there, the machine learning example, um, this was a bit more of just an exploration of a, of a method that I read about um, for a library that I, the Python library that I'd seen. So I wanted to see if I could implement it. Um, so they just use it, the NDVI time series as an input and the features that the models use um, are just derived from the, from the date time series. So it's things like the day of the, the day of the year and the month of the year and, you know, a three month rolling mean of NDVI. I think features like that. 
Um, so th those um, forecasts there are using a random forest regressor, but that notebook also shows an example of using XG boost with coupled with Dask. So it actually does a, a distributed prediction. Um, so yeah, and uh, so the next steps from this would be to try and ref I'd like to take the, the vector auto regression notebook, um, clean it up a little bit more with some better markdown um, and try and push it into the notebooks repositories for Africa and, and um, Digital Earth Australia. Um, and then it'd be cool to look into trying to do the per pixel predictions, even if it's at a relatively coarse scale um, to try and match the grids of the data sets that are going in. So that's where I got, thank you. Yeah, that is very cool, Chad. Um, yeah, pretty amazing to see what you could do in just like a couple of days. Yeah. Uh, so now we'll move on to the, the women's sprint. Um, so Fung, would you like to introduce the, um, the speakers and just say slide when you want me to click along? Sorry. Hi, um, I would just first say a couple of words um, to thank everyone who has helped organizing the event and participated in the Women's Spring. So here's just a collection of pictures we gathered from um, the attendees and um, thank you so much for attending. Um, so, uh, and in particular, I want to personally thank Megan Halabeski who uh, really bring all these amazing teams together and made this happen. Um, and also a special thanks to Edward Boma who is our technical manager based in Ghana. Um, if it's not with Edward, well, Edward has been helping um, and supporting people working in the African and European time zone. So um, it wouldn't be the same event without Edward. So thank you so much. Um, and um, the whole event, I think, um, as you have seen, it's really um, a grand experiment. We were quite ambitious to try to do this um, spring. Um, from so many time zones around the world as a virtual event. Um, and all of the people who has joined the sprint um, were involved in different ways. Some has just come off, um, come by to say hi, join the Zoom session or the Slack channel. Um, some did some really cool projects you'll hear about. Um, and also, um, people worked in teams. Um, and, you know, some people did just telling stories, some, um, oh, thank you, Ife, um, and, um, and then also some um, do, did more coding. Um, and regardless of the involvement, it was really, really nice to see so many people join um, and great to connect with um, all the women um, around the globe. Um, and what we really hope for, and Drew, if you go to the next slide, is that the connections we build within this event um, are going to continue. Um, and one of the, um, the event we're inviting you to come and um, join is the Geo Mixer. So there's a link there. You can go to the event details. Um, so the ladies of Lance and the Sister of Star are both involved in organizing the Geo Mixer. Um, the next event is in July, but it's not a great time um, for the Australians. So um, hopefully uh, the August um, GeoMixer will be a better time and so come to um, join this event in the next two mixer um, and we'll be able to talk about um, the, the, our experience in the sprint as well. So um, Andrew if you move to the next slides I think that starts our um, actual presentation of the work that we've done so far and I'll pass on to Bex first um, to talk about the wetland tool project. Cool. Hey, um, so I hopped on to the wetlands team with Fung, uh, Megan Halabiski, Kate Figgis, Flavia de Souza Mendez, and Alison Bailey. Um, and we built a tool for taking a look at wetland dynamics um, and the spectral temporal features of wetlands. So, um, yeah, we've got a notebook that. Um, is interactive and you can draw a polygon for an area that you're interested in um, or multiple areas within uh, an area of data that you load. So we tested it out in a couple of places. Um, this slide's the Okavango wetlands. So the little, there's a polygon in the middle of a water body there that's in blue. There's a polygon that's over a smaller, more vegetated wetland to the north of it and then over to the east there is a slightly um, drier higher uh, area that's been selected as well and so just for this plot we've had a bit of a look at how those three areas have varied from uh, 
2019 to 2020 um, in how wet they are, how green they are and how bright they are using the tassel cap indices. Uh, and then we had a bit of a look um, through the Landsat archive. So on the left is using the Sentinel-2 data, down the bottom on the right is using the Landsat data from 1987 to 2021. So this particular area as a whole um, has got a little bit more variable in how green it is in the last couple of years. So there were a couple of interesting um, changes that happened, um, such as, yeah, 2020, um, it was quite green, sort of January, February, March, and then it's quite not green later in the year as compared to uh, 2019, where there's sort of the drop in the um, brightness and in the greyness, a bit of a jump in the wetness. So something's going on there. Um, maybe somebody who's a little bit more familiar with that particular wetland area might have an idea of what was happening in those couple of years. Uh, we also took it for a spin. Um, can we change the slide, please? Uh, over an area that I think Alison Bailey is more familiar with, um, which is an area of uh, agroforestry in Mozambique. And so I think it's an area where they're looking at um, sort of doing a little bit more of the agroforestry and combining well, combining the agriculture with uh, sort of trees as well and making everything um, awesome, which you can see when you look at the phenology day of year plot, everything's kind of getting uh, <laughs> greener and in the more recent years, um, like the yellow stuff's up the top of the plot. So you can run the tool over this and kind of go, yeah, that looks like it's changed heaps and is doing awesome things, which is kind of cool. Can we go to the next slide? So, Fung, did you want to talk to this one? Or do you want me to? <laughs> if you want me to. <laughs> so, um, my personal interest is to be able to use this tool to also look at other data sets like radar, which is really hard to understand what's going on. Um, so this is an area that we found accidentally um, off the coast of Senegal. Um, so the first set of figures there is just showing, uh, well, actually there's a dam built right in the middle of that image. And so we were really just curious looking at this and trying to understand what is happening because on the two sides of the dam, um, the land cover looks completely different, although they were part of the wetland, uh, part of the same wetland area. So um, yeah, so, um, the, the plot is similar to what Bex has just explained, um, but in addition to just using the optical data, um, we've also managed to add the radar, which is uh, which the 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 index that's showing is um, pseudo entropy, so it's kind of inversely related to um, vegetation. So. You can see um, also the impact of rainfall potentially on the radar data. So I'm hoping that this can help understand what is going on um, in different sensors. But the other thing really interesting is this dam was built in 1988. So um, I was curious to see if there's any long term, well, we, we can see how that has changed the environment. So using the same um, phenology plot that Bex has just shown, um, it looks like. Uh, Around um, end of 1980s, um, 1990, uh, beginning of 1990, um, that area really has changed from being very wet um, to, or no, being really green um, to really, really dry and brown. So, um, yeah, it looks like we can use Landsat to track this kind of changes. And thanks so much, Bax, for um, helping out and putting together tools to do these cool plots. Um yeah, so hopefully this will end up in the D Africa Sandbox Notebooks repo. Um, and I might try and port some of it across to um, like a more generalized one as well. And I think currently we sort of threw the kitchen sink at it a bit. So I think it's got um, radar indices, um, climate data, um, 
can't remember what else we put in it, but we had a bit of a list and I think we got most of it in there. So it does um, multi-sensor, multi-index um, stuff. So it will be useful for looking at things, hopefully. Um, yeah, I think that's us. Thank you, Bax. I think uh, I'll leave Ife to coordinate who to present um, the project sure. here. If uh, <laughs> no worries. Um, so I'm going to be speaking quickly about what we did in the collective storytelling using Earth Observation Sprint. Uh, we had a fair amount of interest, which was really awesome. And so we ended up following up on two ideas. And the first one was observing trends in Mount Kilimanjaro's ice cap, which uh, we were hoping could be used as an indicator of climate change in that region. So the answer is, and well, the answer is yes. We can see a significant change between 2019 and uh, 1986. But I'd also like to say that, so this sprint in particular was really focused on the ability to pull information from our maps portal to tell a story without. So the focus can be on the data and less on the coding or the technical ability. And so this team, uh, which included Lisa, Catherine and Aileen, uh, who I'm not sure if they are here today, uh, pulled this together um, and I've cut out some of their slides. So if you go to the next slide, please, Andrew. Uh, in between that picture of, of 1984 to uh, 2019 or 2021, as we've seen these 3D pictures, they considered lots of other things, such as uh, problems in the analysis, such as cloud cover, cloud versus snow, seasonal variation, and seasonal snow cover versus permanent ice. But all these things could be addressed looking at different layers available on the Digital Earth Africa Maps portal. Uh, with no need to go into the sandbox or any of the Python analysis environments. And the results were pretty clear. This backs up some uh, research in the area and they actually made a much more extensive PowerPoint about it, which we have summarized here. I think there might be one more slide on this, Andrew, is there? Yeah, and so then we found that this, the sort of dirty maps portal, Analysis really lends itself well to uh, preliminary conclusions, which could be used to follow up with analysis next steps, which include perhaps going into more of the coding, uh, taking a bit of a close look at seasonal variation um, and quantifying some of the changes that we could visually see. So that was, that was pretty cool. And we hope that, that we can follow up with that further. Um, just the next slide, if you don't mind. Uh, so our second, idea that we've wanted to storytell about was about volcanic eruptions uh, and natural hazards and we chose to focus on the eruption of Mount Nirogongo in DRC which recently uh, erupted and um, actually caused a significant amount of loss of life and damage in the nearby town of Goma and we found that by using the different layers available to us on the maps portal, we could see a whole variety of things. So using the Sentinel-1 data available was easy to see the lava flow coming down from the mountain, um, but using surface reflectance from Sentinel-2, you can actually see on the right-hand side here, this big, um, the actual lava flow, which has cooled down and it's not cloud shadow, which you could, which there isn't any in this particular picture um, but you can see how that encroaches right into the town um, and we also looked at surface temperature so I think the next slide has some of that and this is our Renee's work so just looking at what what Landsat temperature has to tell us and Landsat temperature can be a bit more temperamental um, and as always Landsat's very much affected by cloud cover so we did run into some issues there but lots of things that we could continue to explore. Um, the next slide, I think. Yeah, and so this really backed up our hypothesis that we can build a quick and cohesive uh, data set based on lots of different satellites, just using the maps portal. Again, 
no need for coding, but lends itself well to potential future analysis. Um, yeah, so Renee, do you have anything to add? You mentioned you might not be able to speak right now, so that's okay um, if you can't. Yep, yeah. hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, yeah, so I come from a background where I uh, work for an Indigenous um, mob. Uh, so yeah, a lot of the data stuff that runs behind the scenes can be really tricky to help like explain things to people. So using all these images um, to tell the story is so much more easier for everybody else. And that's where, where I found this um, program or project, sorry. Yeah, really good for us. So I really enjoyed doing this. Thanks. Thanks, Renee. No worries. Well, I think that's all from us, Fang. Back to you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ife. Um, and thanks for um, leading and coordinating the project um, through the last couple of days. And thank you, Renee. Um, great to have you and hear about um, hear that um, you think this is positive and useful. Um, so I will just very quickly present to the next one on behalf of Eloise and Sarah and Emily. Um, so um, this was very challenging because um, they were working from two opposite time zones and so um, I, I think it's very likely that we'll take this um, discussion and um, collaboration forward after the spring. So it's a really good start that well, we're working together to see how D Africa can help Severe to map this small water bodies. Um, so what this, these couple of images are showing is for this test area in northern Senegal, um, how we can use the existing products in D-Africa like WAFs to see um, the water available, like the water available there, including seeing some of the water bodies um, that, that's a bit further away from the river. Um, and then also um, looking at the different um, extents where water, uh, where it's sometimes inundated um, and more frequently um, has water. And also on the right hand side, you can see that Sentinel-2 with a higher resolution really um, maps these water bodies a lot better. So yeah, so hopefully um, we'll be able to continue develop these methods um, after the sprint um, and improve on um, the water mapping capabilities of D-Africa. And the last but not the least, I'll hand over to Negan to talk about the ship mapping project. Thank you, Fang. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so this project actually uh, was brainstorm with uh, Gobita Suresh Bridget from India and also uh, Joanna um, in South Africa. Uh, thank you for their help and ideas. Um, I did some work with uh, detecting the number of the sh ships or vessels before and after the event. As you can see on the left hand side, we have the ever given location, the cargo ship that was blocked in the Swiss Canal in late March 2021. And then we have the VV polarization for uh, 21st of March and 25th of March. And as you can see, we have uh, shown uh, the high backscatter values for the vessels in that region. Um, I did some analysis with the histogram of the images uh, to identify um, how I can separate the objects from the rest of the image. And I ended up to have um, uh, applied the VOFs for masking, uh, basically water and land, and then thresholding uh, to extract the vessel objects. The count of the vessels before the event was about 40, uh, 85, uh, and it increased to 143. I still see some um, uh, false positives on the left hand side of the before image uh, that I think uh, further masking or using another polarization band might help to uh, actually reduce that false positives. Um, I also uh, want to actually explore the uh, ShipNet, which is a deep learning training data set uh, to actually use the transfer learning to detect the uh, objects based on you know, training data sets that comes from the planet, uh, potentially after the sprint, uh, I will focus on that. Thank you.